all participants. There we go. Across the state and county, counties are grappling with how to decrease their carbon footprint and respond to climate change. This has been an active topic of discussion in Jefferson County, Washington, including the role of forests in addressing the climate crisis. At this next session, we're excited to share an example of county level efforts to quantify carbon sequestration associated with land use and forest management. The project you, you'll hear about shortly is a great example of using technical tools and analysis to guide local action with the involvement of nonprofit organizations, community members, and locally elected officials. We'll hear more about how Jefferson County's Climate Action Committee used the LEARN tool, that is the Land Emissions and Removals Navigator tool, to create a greenhouse gas inventory of forested lands within the county. The resulting study assessed the carbon impact of forest change across the various sub areas of the county, including state, DNR managed lands, federal forests, national parks, commercial slash industrial private forest land, small landowners, county owned land, the city of Port Townsend urban growth area, and the Port Hadlock urban growth area. Quite a mouthful. The presenters will share the driving factors behind this analysis, the methodology, results, lessons learned, and next steps. We hope this session provides ideas and transferable lessons for other communities motivated to conduct a greenhouse gas analysis and take action to enhance the carbon storage and sequestration of their forests. Now, please allow me to introduce our panel of speakers. First up, we have Heidi Eisenhower, who was elected to the Jefferson County Board of County Commissioners in 2020. She is an experienced nonprofit executive, having served locally as Chief Operating Officer at the Northwest Maritime Center, most recently an Executive Director at Jefferson Land Trust previously. She served on the Jefferson County Planning Commission when the first comprehensive plan was adopted in compliance with the Growth Management Act. Her family has lived in Jefferson County since 1981. Heidi has graduated from Evergreen State College with a degree in environmental science. Next up, we have Dr. Catherine Kopass, who is a Port Angeles-based ecologist whose work spans a wide range of scales and topics within the broader context of improving our understanding of vegetation's role in global climate change. Catherine holds a PhD in biology from the University of Alaska Fairbanks and Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Earth Systems from Stanford University. Research on vegetation climate interactions and carbon cycles has taken her from the Andes across the Arctic. Recently, she has been actively engaged with the Olympic Forest Coalition, where her work centers on DNR forest management and policy issues on the Olympic Peninsula. Prior to that, her career with the National Park Service involved projects monitoring landscape change and describing and mapping native plant communities within the national parks in Washington State. Last but not least, we have Cindy Jane, who is a community volunteer focused on climate issues in Jefferson County, Washington. She chaired the Port Townsend slash Jefferson County Joint Climate Action Committee for 10 years and currently is vice chair and chair of its forest working group. She's co-author of three recent greenhouse gas modeling reports of Jefferson County, including one on forest modeling. She was also project manager for the planning for climate change in the North Olympic Peninsula project through North Olympic Development Council. She has managed projects for over 20 years in both for-profit and non-profit organizations. She has an MBA and a BS and an MS in electrical engineering and designed medical devices prior to retirement. And I'll hand it over to our presenters. Great, thank you so much for the introductions there, Rico. And thanks all for the opportunity to be here today. As mentioned, I'm a member of the Port Townsend Jefferson County Climate Action Committee and happy to be joined by my co-presenters to present results from uh, some recent uh, modeling by the Climate Action Committee. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Can you all see that all right? That's good, great, great. So, Moving on, so to give you an overview of what we'll be covering today, uh, I'll start out with a little bit of history from the Climate Action Committee in Jefferson County, and also talk about some historical greenhouse gas analysis and recent uh, other greenhouse gas analyses. 
I will then turn it over to Catherine to talk in more detail about the forestry modeling methodology and the results. I'll jump back in to talk a little bit about replicating it in other communities, and then Heidi will talk about next steps. And uh, you can see from this photo here, it's always nice to ground us in what this land actually looks like. So this is an example of some of the wilderness and national park forest areas taken from the top of Colonel Bob Mountain in the southwest corner of Jefferson County, looking to the northeast. So to give you some uh, history of climate action uh, work in the county focused by the Climate Action Committee, back in 2007, Jefferson County and the city of Fort Townsend jointly adopted a goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions 80% below the 1990 levels by 2050. And then the next year in 2008, the city and county jointly formed a Climate Action Committee to advise the city and county on climate policies, programs, and priorities followed in 2011 by adopting a climate action plan that included a 2005 greenhouse gas inventory <clears throat> of emissions. And that, that inventory did not include uh, forests or trees as that was not part of the common protocols and tools of the day. So then in 2020, the CEC approved an updated greenhouse gas, uh, I'm calling it the sector-based emissions inventory based on 2018 data. And you can see what the major sectors are. So this is focused on the emission side. And here, transportation was the, the major factor. And you can see the other components. The agriculture in this case was only based on livestock um, because we did not have good tools at the time to estimate from forests and trees. Then after that, the next year in 2021, the CAC approved the opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions based on the 2018 most recent data. And not surprisingly, since transportation was the major source of emissions, uh, the, the, that report focused on a variety of transportation possible uh, ways of reducing emissions. And then we'll be discussing this latest report today, the Greenhouse Gas County, uh, Jefferson County Forest and Tree uh, Greenhouse Gas Inventory. And then I'll circle back at the end to talk about how that compares to this 2020 uh, look at emissions uh, focused inventory. And you can see that report at this link here. And now I'll turn it over to Catherine to discuss the recent forest and tree inventory. So we know that the forests in Jefferson County and, and across the Pacific Northwest have some of the highest carbon removal uh, potential in the United States of America, as seen as in the darker colors on this map. So when the opportunity came to improve the 2018 um, Jefferson County Greenhouse Gas Inventory uh, with an approach that more fully accounts for the role of forests, it was clear that we needed to, uh, to jump on that opportunity. So I'm gonna give you a, a kind of a high level summary of the methods that we used. Um, we applied the LEARN tool, Land Emissions and Removals Navigator, um, which is a, a, a tool that has been developed to allow communities to, to uh, pull together these analyses fairly easily. So it uh, starts with looking at land changes among six pretty aggregated land cover classes from the National Land Cover Database. And uh, these include forests, grasslands, wetlands, settlements, agriculture, and other land, which is primarily rock or ice. So the tool tracks changes between the land cover um, between two time periods. And so the land cover class can stay the same, um, but the, uh, the, the, um, the land cover can stay the same, but it adds in additional information about disturbances in forested areas due to fire, insects, or harvest. So the cover is the same, but the activities are incorporated in the carbon estimates. The, um, the LEARN platform also includes a harvested wood products calculator that in, um, estimates carbon storage um, related to harvest activities. So it uses, and in this case, we use the Washington DNR timber harvest data um, to feed into that calculator. So just a, a little more detail about our study area. Um, so Jefferson County is just over 1 million acres and overall is 76% forested. The LEARN tool allows you to input different areas for the analysis. So we modeled the entire county, of course, 
but we also ran the tool um, in each of the sub areas shown on the map. So we um, combined the Olympic National Park and the National Forest Wilderness Areas, that's in the light green, and then had separate uh, modeling for the National Forest in dark green, DNR managed lands in brown, commercial and industrial private forest lands in red, and then the remaining public and private parcels um, in gray. And then up in the uh, east, the the right side of the slide you see in yellow the city of Port Townsend um, urban growth area and a small area in blue that's the Port Hadlock urban growth area. So those were our, our sub areas that we used in the analysis. So um, we're going to focus in on the city of Port Townsend area because we actually uh, changed up the methodology a little bit. This was a two-step process where we started with the, um, the, the first step out of the, uh, the LEARN tool, which gave us the um, forested areas that are in green on this image. And then from the, the LEARN um, tool, the red area would have been a variety of other classes, um, but did not, but not, not forested. So about 25% of the Port Townsend area would map as forest and the rest um, it's non-forest or trees outside of forest. So because of that, we um, did a, a second step using what, what uh, the iTree model, which was built into this kind of learn platform. But for the iTree model, uh, we generated a thousand um, points and then evaluated those points in the year um, 2011 and 2018. And so the iTree tool compares um, whether there's a tree canopy or a tree in the first imagery and how that changes in that second time period and uh, also calculates uh, associated carbon removals and emissions. This is, was pretty intensive work. Um, and so we, we just looked at two time periods for this. So moving on to, um, to our results. So starting again with the city of Port Townsend, because we uh, we did do that second step with the iTree model. Um, first, I want to just orient people a little bit to, this is called a waterfall diagram, and it can take a little while to get oriented to it. But with the waterfall diagram, it allows you to look at the um, different contributions to the net um, carbon dioxide totals. So in this case, um, CO2 removals from the atmosphere in green, and CO2 emissions to the atmosphere are in red. And um, kind of move from left to right to look at some of the different factors contributing to our net result. So undisturbed forest is that first big bar on the left. And we see that uh, even within the city of Port Townsend, undisturbed forest is uh, removing a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere. And then um, moving on, we, we see, uh, some emissions from harvest and small emissions from forest transitioning to other land surface categories, including forest to settlement. And so in the learn tool, trees outside of forest is uh, kind of substitute in the, the uh, higher level results we have from the eye tree. So that's remaining 75% of that, that red area that was shown in the image. Um, there, uh, there were removals from the tree canopy uh, and those outweighed uh, the loss um, in emissions, we think was primarily due to development. So we have a net removal within the city of 8,000 metric tons of CO2 per year. So this, this kind of points out um, the benefit of adding in that higher level analysis with the, with the iTree um, component. Okay, so moving up in scale, now we're looking at the results from the entire county, uh, but minus the Olympic National Park forest and wilderness areas. Um, so, so note, uh, first of all, a pretty impressive result that undisturbed forests in the county uh, removed more than 2 million tons of CO2 per year um, during this period, which is 2011 to 2016. So some of the other elements that we can uh, kind of look into with the with the learn results include the role of natural disturbances um, in the forests. Now, 
It was a little counterintuitive to me, but natural disturbances don't show up as emissions, but they're calculated as reductions from that overall potential um, carbon removal. So it still creates a net removal, it's just smaller than it might have been if the forest hadn't been disturbed. Um, Non-forest to forest transitions capture growth in um, previously harvested or severely disturbed areas. And then the next category is kind of relate to, to some elements of um, to forest harvest. So we have the harvested wood products, which is a about a 20% credit that goes, uh, that counters uh, the emissions from forest harvest. So those are harvested wood products um, that retain carbon for long periods of time um, in other uses. Then we have the emissions from forest harvests and emissions that are detected as forest areas transition to other lands, including um, to settlements and then some uh, removals from those trees outside of forest areas, leading to a, a net removal um, of 1.6 million um, metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. And then just looking at one other of our sub areas, this an area of small public forests and private landowners is a, um, a looking at the role of like a, a fair amount of undisturbed forest uh, contributing to significant carbon removals from the atmosphere. But we also see the impact of forest harvest and, and compared to some other categories, um, we see emissions from transitions uh, probably due to conversion of uh, forest areas to non-forest within this land uh, category. Still overall, a net removal of over 300,000 um, tons of carbon um, dioxide per year. We looked at the the variation, so trying to think a little bit about you know what what are the role of these different ownership types in our in our um, overall results. So we kind of put together an, this analysis that allows us to explore um, the different ownership type contributions to the totals. So again, in this case, negative number, number which is going up is indicating carbon dioxide um, emissions and then uh, the numbers uh, going down are removals. And so uh, the other thing we added to this graph on the right is the percent of the ownership, the percent of the um, ownership type that has forested land cover. So the Forest Service and DNR had the highest rates of CO2 removal per acre. And of course, those are also the highest percent forested. Again, we we're thinking that the coming into this, thinking that the park would be a um, would be at the top of the scale. But actually, you know, that picture that Cindy showed us at the beginning of the talk reminds us that the national park is actually compared to the other um, ownership types has a very high percentage of of less productive um, subalpine forests and subalpine and alpine um, landscapes that have a lot of rock and ice and are, um, are not going to be removing uh, much uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And then we can see uh, some other variations in the rates across the, um, the ownership types. And again, thinking about the way that the, um, the, the LEARN tool kind of combines the trees outside of forest and how we'd use the iTree tool to try to refine that estimate. You can see this, is, this doesn't include that step. So it's a we have low uh, percent forested um, areas with mixed levels of, of emissions. So we kind of an argument for, for trying to find um, using that I treat tool when, when possible. And then lastly, this shows the percent of the total removals by ownership. Um, when we incorporate the park, uh, you see that the, the, the park does remove a lot of a CO2 um, from the atmosphere, and um, this slide com combines that that look. And again, the the only ownership type that's a a net emitter is the commercial and industrial forests. We ran a learn tool for multiple time groups, so we were able to compare um, the two thousand one to two thousand six period to two thousand eleven to two thousand sixteen and gave us some um, some insights into some potential trends. 
Um, so between those two time periods, the CO2 removal calculated for the entire county actually decreased um, slightly, which um, ideally we, we, you know, we would like to see uh, carbon removed from the atmosphere over time. But that gave us some insights into some of the factors um, in the LEARN tool that could be contributing to these trends. Um, one is a slight decrease in the mapped total forest area between those two time periods. And then uh, other, other elements that we noticed was a decrease in um, removals between the two time periods from the national park, which we attributed to both um, the occurrence of the Paradise Fire, which was a unique and a, a large um, fire that occurred in lowland temperate rainforest, very carbon dense um, forest type. And between that fire and some increases in insect activity in that time period, we could see that impacted um, the results from the National Park. And then um, a big decrease in removals um, from the commercial industrial lands that you know just represents the different time periods of activity. So there was more harvest in the later period um, compared to the earlier period. And then another result we saw based on using the learn the uh, the i uh, the i tool was a decrease in tree canopy outside of forests in the city of Port Townsend UGA. Um, so. Just re our results reinforcing that the Jefferson County forests are some of the best in the US uh, for removing uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. The LEARN tool estimates were at 3.6 million tons of CO2 per year. And then this analysis let us evaluate the emissions and removals in the different land ownership types. And we gained some insights into how some of the landscape change and disturbance factors really affect the um, carbon dioxide um, balance in at a county scale. And um, we also saw a, a slight decrease in the city of Port Townsend forest and trees, although the CO2 removals didn't, didn't track on that. They're actually increasing in that same time frame. But it certainly gave us the, this analysis and using the LEARN tool and the, the iTree tool gave us a lot to think about in terms of feeding this information back into the county's greenhouse gas inventory. And with that, I'll pass it back to Cindy. Great, thank you. Let's see, can you hear me okay? Okay. Yep, okay, great. <laughs> it looked like I was maybe muted. Um, so yeah, so now circling back to um, that original 2018 inventory that was the sector-based emissions focused on transportation, residential, commercial, industrial, that number was about 275,000 um, metric tons of CO2, which you see in red here. And now this most recent inventory looking across the entire county, including the full county was about 3.7 million metric tons or 3.7 yeah, 3 million metric tons per year removal, which we're showing in green here. So overall we're removing about 13 times what we're emitting in the county currently for that roughly uh, 2011 to 2018 time period. So while it shows the net removal, which is great, it's really not surprising given the large forested area, obviously the large national park in our county, the relatively small population of about 30,000 and limited industrial facilities. It's really expected that the sequestration ability of our forests here in Jefferson County will be key for Washington state and perhaps even the US as a whole in meeting their greenhouse gas goals. But in seeing these results, we were glad to have this new data as it clearly shows that a significant component of our overall greenhouse gas picture for the county is the impact from forest and trees. So in terms of replicating it in other communities, the LEARN tool can really be easily used to generate a quick result for, uh, for a county. It can be run in literally a few minutes and get this sort of summary report that you see on the right side here once the, the uh, county is selected. The iTree analysis that Catherine mentioned for the urban tree canopy is a bit more time intensive, but as she uh, talked about, it's very useful for modeling, uh, modeling areas outside of forests, which is important for urban areas and provides a more refined estimate for those areas. 
The data from the DNR harvest reports that we have in Washington State are readily available for each county and can be used to calculate that harvested wood product utilizing the LEARN calculator that Catherine mentioned as part of the tool. Then with GIS support, uh, it's easy to analyze other areas of ownership as we did. And we found the results were helpful to understand uh, how this all fits into the overall the community's overall greenhouse gas emissions, plus provides a baseline for the future. And note that the LEARN tool has also been used in Whatcom County, I know, in Washington State, and has also been used in counties throughout the country. And this is just an example of kind of the home page of the LEARN report, or the LEARN tool. You can enter your county here, and it gives you this land cover uh, mapping. And then by selecting an inventory period, you can go on and generate that report. So I'm start to move into some of the next steps uh, included in the report um, for the city of Port Towns and some of the next steps included support for community forests and other forest conservation projects, looking at uh, permanently protecting city owned older forests where consistent with the Growth Management Act, consider revising the tree ordinance to encourage retaining standing trees as practical, again, uh, consistent with an urban growth area and then looking at potentially adopting goals for carbon sequestration on city lands. We're fortunate that the city was recently awarded two USDA urban foreign forest management grants, including one to develop an ur urban forest management plan, uh, which will also update the tree ordinance. So uh, that'll help make some good progress towards these goals and next steps. And next I'll hand it off to Commissioner Eisenhower to talk about some current county efforts. Thanks, Cindy and Catherine. Um, I am going to just cover on this slide some of the work that we're currently doing as a county. And um, as was mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I've been a commissioner for about three years. So some of this stuff started up before I was even a commissioner, and I was involved with some of it in my past role. So the first thing um, is that we as a county, every couple of years, re review our climate action goals. and update them. And so I highlighted a few key climate action goals that we've been working towards as a county. One is to transition some of our departments to electric vehicles, which we've slowly begun as, as we uh, kind of sunset vehicles, we then consider replacing those with electric vehicles. And I'll just mention that our transit agency here is also has a, um, I guess it's a policy or a resolution to um, move their fleet to electric. And so that we had just uh, uh, authorized the purchase of our second electric bus for our transit um, agency here in Jefferson County. And we're slowly moving in that direction as we replace vehicles. Um, simple things like a countywide recycle program, that's in our climate action goals. Mandating the use of recycled paper, which when I came in, I'm like, don't we already do that? And I learned that in fact we didn't and the commissioner's office we I said let's just buy recycled paper so we started doing that I mean that's very basic but um we take on bigger challenges too and Catherine and I have both been involved in um, non-motorized facilities in Jefferson County and the extension and well, creation and extension of the Larry Scott and Olympic Discovery Trails and then also smaller connector trails that will connect larger trails to each other so that people can actually get um, take longer trips in Jefferson County. Um, our solid waste department has been working on waste reduction. And one thing that I've been active in lately is I'm on a Department of Ecology committee to develop model ordinances for um, getting organics out of the waste stream. And that's um, that has climate implications. Um, our Department of Community Develop recently undertook a sea level rise study as part of uh, a, a, a grant we got from Ecology, and they've also put on a climate lens and updating their shoreline master program uh, to look at uh, sea level rise there. The second bullet here is in 2023, legislation was passed um, uh, mandating that counties in incorporate a climate change and resili resiliency element into their comp comprehensive plans via their next updates. So Jefferson County will be doing an update of our comp plan next year in 2025. And as part of that, we'll be developing a climate change and resiliency chapter of the comp plan. Um, back 
to the forest's front. I see that, Brian. I will, this is my longest slide, I promise. Um, uh, we have developed a county forestry program and we did a plan and then did a pilot in 2021 with four harvests on four county properties. Jefferson County owns about 1800 acres of land and 300 parcels and 80% of that is covered in forests. So we are uh, forest land owners ourselves and are um, undertaking some management of our own forest, for, mostly for forest health reasons, but that will lead to more carbon being sequestered as those trees um, grow in diameter. Um, we have been very active in over about 15 years supporting the expansion of the Daybob Bay natural area um, in, in Southeast Jefferson County. And that um, project is seeing another push right now to do a further expansion that um, will add exciting acreage and forest land to the Daybob Bay natural area. And then on the bigger picture, we've been working to advocate um, for conservation of key tracts of state forest trust lands that are managed by DNR in Jefferson County. And um, working with DNR to identify areas that might be hard for them to manage and better in another status. And so we're working with them to transfer some lands to the county through the trust land transfer program, which is a program that I've been involved on a work group for the last two years to revitalize. So the other thing is that we're playing, um, the last thing is an active role in DNR management of forests, both statewide and in Jefferson County via a number of work groups, including most recently a carbon and forest work group that was um, uh, designed by an $83 million um, Climate Commitment Act, Natural Climate Solutions uh, proviso that passed the legislature in the last session. So a lot of work on, on the forest front in Jefferson County. And next slide, can I do that myself? Maybe, no, oh. So um, in the most recent report, there were a couple of next steps one was to fund and expand the county forestry program and include carbon management on county lands. This is a lot of our forest health work that we'll be doing and we have um, continued and expanded the county forestry program to do further um, forest health thinnings and um, forest management of our own lands. And then the second here is um, to do some education around forest management on private lands and um, develop policies that maximize carbon storage. And that's something that we have yet to embark on. Next slide. So together with the city, you know, we're, we're trying to lead the way on a few fronts and trying to work with our colleagues in, um, at DNR and in the timber industry and other stakeholders in the community to engage our Congress, our, our legislative delegation and I guess our congressional delegation too, although I'm not very active on that, in developing carbon policies and programs that will lead to um, viable, a viable carbon market and carbon pricing for that resource. And then we are adopting and advocating for goals for carbon sequestration um, as a city and county, but that that is work that's kind of defined by the plan that we just completed. And always looking for opportunities to encourage and incentivize tree planting. I mean, that feels like paper recycling to me. We should all be out with a hoedad every day, right? So um, I think that is the end of my slides. One minute remaining. Anyone want the last minute? <laughs> okay, we'll give it over to the questions, the questions in the room, if there are any. Thank you so much, uh, Heidi, Catherine, and Cindy. Um, as a Jefferson County resident, I really appreciate all the work that y'all have been doing, as well as being able to hear some of the background stuff. So that's been awesome. Um, we've scaled from global to local in our themes today, and I'm sure that there's plenty of questions for y'all. Uh, so we have about 15 minutes uh, to start with for discussion. Um, so I'll start with this one. Um, this is for Cindy and Catherine. What motivated Jefferson County's Climate Action Committee to undertake a greenhouse gas inventory of forested lands in the county? Were there any difficulties in getting the project started? 
Yeah, maybe I'll jump in on, on that one. Um, it was really the fact that when we did the 2018 inventory, there weren't good tools yet available, readily available for doing the analysis. And so when we saw that there was a new to, tool available, we were eager to go forward and do that because we recognized that likely the trees and forests would have a fairly significant impact on Jefferson County. In terms of challenges, I don't, yeah, we were fortunate. Uh, you, we have an amazing community of volunteers. So we were really fortunate to be able to pull together a group, uh, a team that was uh, willing to participate in the analysis um, and got some good guidance from uh, the ICLEI organization that uh, was showing that. So they had a training program that we went through uh, and it was really helpful for work, helping us work through the tool. So yeah, I don't think there were any particular challenges. It took a while, <laughs> I, think it, I think it was a year and a half, so it wasn't a quick process, but uh, yeah, I think we just were able to just continue moving through it. You know, Catherine, if you wanna add anything. Great, thank you. Um, good to hear that it went smoothly. Uh, from Catherine's last slide, this is from Cindy Bratz. It sounds as though selective thinning and still getting harvests could be performed in a manner that enhances growth of remaining forests, thus getting higher CO2 removals. Is this correct? That's a good question. That is uh, the thinking, although it would depend on some other ecosystem elements, including the level of soil disturbance and the rate of the growth of the trees. Well, it's an area where I think a lot of people are looking in to try to, to find that sweet spot where we can do things like forest thinnings to improve health and feel um, like we're gaining in terms of um, carbon sequestration as well. Great, thank you. Um, we have sort of a next group of questions uh, that are related to actions moving forward. How do you see the results of the study influencing local policies or initiatives related to climate action and forest conservation? And any of the three of you feel free to jump in. I guess I'll, I'll start and then maybe uh, hand it over to Commissioner Eisner to see if she wants to add more. But cer certainly, you know, I think that was part of the report was the next steps. And so that was from the Climate Action Committee's perspective, you know, we were looking forward to say, OK, now that we have this data, what do we see as potential next steps? So that was kind of our, our take on that. And then our, we're continuing um, to look at that and, and look for opportunities to move those forward. Uh, and I, I would just add, I'm unmuted, yeah, I would just add that, you know, the, the couple of studies, these couple of greenhouse gas studies, the first one really underscored the uh, vehicle emissions. And so we're, you know, trying to tackle that as well as all this forest stuff, uh, you know, all kind of at the same time. So it feels very busy. And it also feels like it's really important to have a lot of conversations with stakeholders around forest management in, in Western Washington so that we have a common understanding of what we're trying to do moving forward. And a number of us um, just today were part of the work group that came out of that $83 million proviso in the last legislative session that said, you know, we needed to gather around a table and contemplate, you know, what can, um, what policies we can advocate for that will put, um, uh, carbon sequestration and, and climate, you know, uh, remediation in place, as well as ensuring a sustainable cut for the timber industry, because our entire, you know, community depends on forest products. So those conversations literally started today. So it's a very uh, active, vital time to be involved in these conversations. And I encourage everyone to get involved in their communities and, to reach out to their local elected officials and um, and reach out to, I mean, I'm happy to be a resource. I've been a resource for a number of counties, you know, who are like, how, how did you put that letter together to DNR? And I'm like, I just called Catherine and I said, we got to figure this out. Let's start typing. And, you know, it's just, it's a lot of work, but it's really important to do the work and to know who your stakeholder, your par partners in the community are like Jefferson Land Trust. I just saw Owen Fairbank from Jefferson Land Trust post a comment here and to work in collaboration because, um, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna talk about my favorite, favorite metaphor again here, but you know, it's important to work in partnership with everyone you can in your community to get this work done because the um, it's, it's gonna be a steep climb. 
Well, the next question uh, is related to that. What sort of collaboration would be valuable uh, from other landowners and stakeholders in order to act on the findings of this study? Well, I can I can keep going on collaboration. I mean, I think in Jefferson County, um, I've I've lived most of my life here, so I'm sorry if I'm Jefferson County centric, but um, you know, we were part of developing the community forest legislation. I, I think it was like 15 years ago. Ellen can correct me if I'm wrong. And we got funding for one of the first community forests on Chimicum Ridge. Um so that's one strategy is to develop things like community forests in your community where we can demonstrate best practices. And then our county taking on a forestry program of our own and working with Mallory Weinheimer of Chickadee Forestry, um, we're, we're working very actively to, to understand kind of the scale in our community of small landowners and how we can be supportive. And then also demonstrating harvest techniques through county owned lands. Um, someone had posted a question about whether um, thinning, struggling, overcrowded forests actually improves carbon. And I, everything I've heard, it does, you know, as, as trees grow, they gain the ability to um, sequester more carbon and giving them the conditions where they can grow more effectively um, only, only um, encourages that. So I think it's just understanding who the resources are in your community and then gathering them together and saying, problem by problem, addressing those problems together and having really smart, smart people like Cindy Jane on your team who are willing to dig through the data and, you know, do a lot of number crunching and say, this is, this is what the data tells us. And so that gives us a roadmap for things we can try as a community in collaboration with our partners. And it's, you know, it's not, um, there's not a blueprint for this work that can be applied to anyone, every community. And so it's a little bit of taking best practices and sharing like we are in this conference and then um, being committed to being available to share and, and ask answer questions in the future as they come up for, for communities, so. Great, thank you, Heidi. Um, I'm gonna venture over to the technical side of things. Um, so it was mentioned that significantly different rates of CO2 removal per acre between, there's different rates uh, between different ecotypes, in particular that subalpine forests within the national park and USFS wilderness areas. What does this mean for the temperate lowland forests in Jefferson County? I think what it what I'll go ahead and jump in. I think you know what it showed us is that when you take a you take a tool that takes a very broad landscape view, it's gonna you know we we didn't just model the lowland forest. So when we have a, a result that that averages um, carbon removals for a landscape like the park, it's it might be different than we expected because um, because it's got a lot of non non forest types really in it that that are or or forest types that are less productive that are gonna. Uh, kind of reduce the average compared to DNR lands or the lowland um, US, uh, the, the, the forest service lands that are in operation, because those are all generally lower elevation, highly productive um, conifer forests. Thank you. Um, this next question is from Janet Alderton. Uh, we have forests that grew up unmanaged after clear cutting, the dense under, with a dense understory of shrubs, especially things such as ocean spray, as well as invasives like scotch broom. This creates a fairly large wildfire hazard. Um, does thinning of struggling overcrowded trees and removal of this dense understory shrubs have a positive or negative impact on medium to long-term carbon storage? I was kind of referring to that question in my last answer, but I was wondering if either Cindy or Catherine have a more uh, science-based answer to medium or long-term carbon storage of uh, trees growing. Again, I think if the um, if some of it depends on how the forest is impacted by that harvest. Some of it depends on where those materials go. Um, for for uh, so if we're we're trying to reduce fire hazards, I mean, I, ideally from a carbon standpoint, we would leave those residues in the ecosystem. But from a fuels reduction risk, obviously, it's the neighbors are going to be upset when they come through and see there's actually even more fuel on the forest floor. Um, and so I. I I mean, I think that's an area, like, again, I alluded to, we know that if we can 
extend rotations and and create environments in these overstock forests in which the trees can grow fast um, better with less competition we're gonna uh, sequester more carbon but I, I think the math is a little bit tricky in, in determining um, where those pluses and minuses are and where they, they kind of occur in the time following following the thinning so um, so I think our overall goal again is to increase in my opinion is to increase carbon sequestration um, reduce fire hazards and in some cases, the, the carbon accounting may not be perfectly in our favor, and I think in some it, it will be. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, moving back over to Heidi, um, given the significant footprint of state trust lands in Jefferson County, how do you see state lands fitting into future county efforts? It's interesting. I've been looking at the map a lot going into this carbon work group, and most of the state trust lands in Jefferson County are in the Olympic Experimental Forest on the West End. So those have not; those acres have not been the acres we've been talking about. We've been talking about these patches of state lands in eastern Jefferson County, a number of them being structurally complex forests and a number of others being relatively adjacent to um, densely populated areas. So we've been kind of tackling things on the structurally complex front and then also talking about areas where there will be more population in the future and really trying to think about the future of, you know, our, how our community can build and enjoy open space and forests, um, you know, 100 years down the road. So um, it's a little bit of both, but I think that um, we're really focused on Eastern Jefferson County right now. And most of those DNR managed lands are in the Olympic Experimental Forest out there experiment, experimenting on the West End. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, this next question is from Chris Mendoza. You stated that Jefferson County is managing a portion of its forests. Are these designated DNR trust lands? And if so, are the county's forest management practices not being managed by DNR state land managers? The, the the lands I was referring to are actually uh, owned by the county. And it's when I said there were 1,800 acres of land owned by Jefferson County and 300 parcels, most being under 10 acres each. And 80% of those 1,800 acres are um, covered in forest. And so what we did with our pilot project is we looked at four different sites that had very different characteristics to see if forest health thinnings could uh, earn the county revenue. And they did, but they they earned us about enough revenue to pay for you know, doing the treatments. So um, those are the county owned forests. There are state forest transfer trusts. So those, those are the county forest trusts that DNR manages on behalf of the county. And that's some of the lands that we've been working with DNR over the last, two and a half years to um, kind of talk to them about how, you know, how we would like to see them managed in the future. Um, and those are the four parcels that I mentioned earlier that we have uh, submitted trust land transfer applications for. There's also a couple of parcels that were actually leased to the county in 2009 by DNR under the trust land transfer program. And those are coming back to the count to county ownership um, through the trust land transfer program. We and the land trust buying the fee remainder of those parcels. And those are in the Quimper Wildlife Corridor on the very northern portion of the Northeast uh, the Olympic Peninsula on the Quimper Peninsula, the head of the dragon. If you look at the an aerial photo of the uh, Northeast Olympic Peninsula, it looks like the outline of a dragon. So um, we are actively working on transferring some lands to the county, but it takes time. I mean, these trust land transfer applications we just submitted will be or considered, and then they might be added to the list. And then in 2025, there might be a list that comes out for biennial funding. So it, but I've seen projects stay on the TLT list for 15 years. So it's a long game. Hey, thank you. Uh, we have a few questions left. This next one is from Brett Anderson. Um, are you planning on compiling the great work you've done to share out with other counties as a guidebook or a toolkit of sorts for those that want to collect or analyze this sort of baseline data for themselves? Yeah, I, I would really recommend people uh, contact ICLEI, uh, the ICLEI 
organization. They are the ones that had been doing the training for this program, and I believe they are going to continue to do trainings uh, going forward. So I think that's a wonderful way they have uh, you know, the, the experts who helped design the tool um, were you know were very helpful as we went through the training. So I think that would be a great way. And then you're certainly welcome to look at uh, at our report and, and other reports out there. And I'm happy to uh, you know help if anyone wants to contact me. Happy to uh, help share more of what we've done. Thank you. Um, this next one's from Lynn Shorn. Uh, do any private do you have any private landowner incentives for those folks to keep trees on their lands? The first one comes to, that comes to my mind is conservation easements through the land trust. If you can work with your local land trust, which in Jefferson County would be Jefferson Land Trust, um, and they identify your property as a priority habitat or farm, oh, oh, working land. Oh, I, I used to be the executive director and I cannot remember the mission statement right now. Sorry. Open space, working land and farmland. Open space working land and forest land. Um, if it fits into their mission, they might be willing to purchase a carbon e carbon um, conservation easement from you, sorry. So car conservation easements are an incentive to keep your land, your forests in forestry, um, but it just depends on what the current priorities of the land trust are and what the characteristics of your property are. That's the one I could think of. I don't know if Cindy or Catherine know of any other incentives. I know there was uh, something discussed on last week's uh, uh, conference here as well of some other uh, programs for 40 acres or more. Thank you, Heidi and Cindy. That brings us to our final question. Um, considering your experience with the LEARN tool, what advice would you offer to other communities looking to replicate a similar analysis? And how can the tool be integrated into broader greenhouse gas strategies? I guess I would say, yeah, I think it's worth just running a quick analysis with the learn tool just to get a sense um, for what it's looking like with your county, just using the the kind of raw output from that tool. And then, yeah, in terms of, you know, it's pretty easy as as you saw with our data, then that's just another piece of your overall community greenhouse gas analysis to to look at. So just as you're, Looking at transportation and commercial and residential, this is another piece that uh, you'll get a sense for, kind of how it, what the priorities are and what the sizes are of the different components. Right. Thank you so much for taking part in this session. We're going to keep things rolling right along with our next presenter, which is the Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary Franz. But first, I'm going to pass it back to Brian for a few announcements. Brian, it's all you. So thank you so much, Rico, and thank you, Jefferson County presenters. And th thank you all presenters. It has been an awesome day. I've just enjoyed everything we've gotten to do uh, today.